All right, amen, amen. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to uh, 1 Timothy. And uh, we'll just look at the passage there that we looked at last week to give us a little bit of a jump start. And uh, do pray for me while you're here and listening and so forth as my voice is going in and out. Lost it on Sunday evening and it's been off and on now. But <clears throat> I hope that you'll be able to uh, hear everything that I'm saying and receive a blessing or at least an, ex uh, an understanding. Uh, but in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we, we began looking at this last week. And um, basically we've been talking about body, soul, and spirit. And right now we're focusing on the body. And for a few weeks we were looking at the body and sin. Uh, our soul is uh, uses or our body is basically a tool a vehicle we've talked about that several times now and so when we sin uh, we do so with our body uh, in the sense that it is our body that takes something if we take something that doesn't belong to us and so on and so forth I, I give you all kinds of illustrations if I wanted to but uh, that's not the sake of this uh, but last week we started looking at our body and sanctity and uh, the idea of our bodies being holy we're told um, Another scripture that uh, that we are to present our bodies, or I'll get to that in a moment. We're told in other scriptures, though, uh, regarding the fact that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, but here in in First Timothy chapter two, we'll just look at verse nine. I'll not spend a lot of time in review from last week, but it says in like manner also, and we understood that to mean from the verses one through eight, he spent time telling us how men ought to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then he says, in the same way, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or perils or costly away, array, uh, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So they're supposed to adorn themselves with good works. You understand that a professing godliness phrase is in the parentheses. And so if we took that out for a moment, we would learn that Women are supposed to adorn themselves in modest apparel, and it goes into a list of things that they shouldn't do, and it says, but rather than adorning themselves with all these things, they should adorn themselves with good works. And the reason why they should do that is because that is comely or acceptable or uh, it becometh women that profess godliness. And so last week, we, we really didn't get into what technically modest apparel is yet, at least not based on the scripture. We took some time to talk about apparel in general and clothing, basically. And uh, we looked at what the purpose of clothing is. We went back to Genesis and we saw the very first time that this concept was brought into place. Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden and they saw that they were naked. And uh, their eyes were open and they saw they were naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and they made for themselves aprons. Uh, God comes along. They have that conversation about... The, you know, who told you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit that I said not to eat of? And, and so they went to this whole blame game with each other and ultimately blaming, you know, the devil. Uh, but we find that, that, uh, that God then uh, killed an animal, uh, maybe two. And we assume it to be a lamb because of the type and picture, but he shed blood. And there is a, a sacrifice, I believe, that's made. It doesn't specifically say that in the scripture. It just says that he made coats of skin. Uh, but I believe that what happened was he made a sacrifice. And, uh, and so God changed what Adam and Eve had. And I don't think we're stretching anything in the scriptures to say that that means, or we can take away from that, that God has an opinion about what we wear. Uh, they made aprons, and if that was sufficient, why would God go through the, the bothering of making them coats of animal skin? You say, well, because he killed the animal. Well, yeah. So what? All the sacrifices in the Old Testament, you don't, don't see them go around making animal skin coats uh, with their sacrifices. So if God was making a sacrifice, he still wouldn't have changed what they were wearing unless he obviously had an opinion about what they were wearing. And, uh, and so uh, we see that he took away the aprons and gave them coats. And there's, I think right there, it tells us some specifics regarding the fact that God wants us to cover our bodies. And so we saw the clothing was a covering and it was to cover our nakedness. Now, I believe everyone here would agree with me that we ought not to be walking around naked, right? I mean, we would agree with that statement. Uh, the question then becomes, well, whose definition of nakedness are we going to use? 
Uh, in other words, we live in a society that everyone has a different definition. I mean, the, the basic that we can all agree on is nakedness would be considered not having a stitch of clothing on. We can all agree that that's naked. Uh, but there are people that, uh, well, um, I don't know how to word this without becoming too graphic, um, but there have been, I don't know if you call them social experiments or what, and, uh, and I'm not saying it's right in any stretch of the imagination, but where women would have uh, their bodies painted and uh, to look like clothing, but it wasn't clothing, it was just body paint. And they would walk out in public to see if anyone noticed that they weren't actually wearing any clothes. And uh, some people didn't take any notice of it, they just figured they were wearing skin-tight clothing. But the truth of the matter is they weren't wearing anything, just paint that was designed to look like jeans or, or what have you. And so some might say, well, that's not naked because the skin is covered. But I would say to you that they're still naked. And, uh, and so we could use different illustrations. For instance, you know, you might uh, go to the beach and you see, you know, someone in a bikini and you say, well, that's not naked, you know, because, you know, they're covered. And, of course, the question could be asked, well, if it's okay for, the, for a lady to, a woman, to go to the beach in a bikini, would it be okay for her to go into Walmart with a bikini on? And a lot of people would say, well, no, that's not acceptable. And yet there are some that would say, well, sure, why not? You know? And, uh, and then we could ask the question, and I, I certainly don't mean to be getting graphic with you, but I'm just trying to prove a point about our, our um, opinions. You say, well, okay, it's okay for her to wear a bikini to the beach. What about if it was just undergarments? It covers as much as a bikini does. In fact, some undergarments might even cover more than the bikini does. Would we say that that's okay? And many people would say, well, no, that would be indecent. Well, why? Because the usage of the garment, uh, they're both indecent. And so it's not enough to have your standard and my standard and their standard and that standard. I want to know what God says. And so everyone agrees that we ought not to be naked. But what does the Bible say about nakedness? And we looked at two specific spots where we looked at several verses that deal with nakedness and what God says about nakedness and how that we ought not to uncover one another's nakedness. But we looked at two spots that told us specifically what nakedness is. One was in Isaiah 47, which is an illustrative passage. Another is a symbolic passage regarding Babylon and so forth. Uh, but in that symbolic passage, it talked about the uncovering of the thigh. And then if we look at the Exodus passage, which is talking to priests, talking to men, uh, it talks about in Exodus 28, 42, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. And then he explains what the linen breeches are supposed to cover. From the loins, even unto the thighs, shall they reach. And so according to God, and, uh, and granted the Exodus passage is very much under the Levitical law that we are not under. Uh, but according to God, <coughs> nakedness for a man was to uncover the thigh from, the, from the, uh, the loins to the thigh. And in Isaiah, referring to, although symbolically referring to a woman, was the uncovering of the thigh or making bare the thigh, making bare the leg. Uh, that was considered nakedness by God. We know, we know that in the uh, Genesis passage, which was before the law, we know there is an issue with them not being clothed enough. They had coverings on, but there wasn't enough coverings. And so God made them coats. And so we see this principle certainly throughout Scripture that we are to cover our nakedness. And God's definition of nakedness, at least regarding that region, would be the uncovering of the thigh. Uh, so that would be your bikinis, that would be your one-piece swimsuits that for some reason we consider to be more modest than the bikini simply because it's now covering the stomach as opposed to not covering the stomach. Uh, that would be any kind of garment that would cause your thigh to be exposed uh, even if the garment itself may be long enough. I don't know if it's in my notes, we'll be looking at it if it is, but in fact now I think by, I think I forgot to put it in my notes. But one of the instructions given to them about building the altar is they were not supposed to make the altar up on a pedestal area where they'd have to climb upstairs to get to for the risk of someone being down below looking up and seeing their thigh from underneath. And so the altar is supposed to be on a, on a level. And so what we learn from that passage, and if I think about it, I might share it with you next week, or you can probably look it up yourself if you're you know, desirous enough to do so. But what we learn from that passage is not even enough that 
the thigh is covered is the fact that we must clothe ourselves and ladies I guess I'm mainly talking to you at the moment because men uh, still at this point don't wear skirts but we'll see how that goes uh, the way our society is going uh, but the not only is our thigh to be covered but we're not even supposed to be in such a way where we allow our thigh to be seen in other words when you're sitting there in a chair and your skirt or your dress rises up uh, your your dress your skirt needs to be long enough that your it does not rise up when you sit or kneel or do some sort of a physical activity that would cause your thigh to be exposed because when you do so according to the bible you're exposing your nakedness now some might say well preacher why are you making such a big deal out of this well let me pray i'll explain why i'm making a big deal and then we'll go on to new territory tonight father i love you thank you for your your goodness to us and i, I realize that what i'm teaching uh, in 2019 is not very popular uh, we as a world and as a people have so much gone the opposite direction of what your word teaches us that for someone to teach what I'm teaching on uh, would make them seem to be archaic and um, old-fashioned well this is the old-fashioned Baptist Church so I suppose it should be accept, uh, expected uh, but father I pray that you, you help us Lord that anyone that's here tonight uh, listening or anyone that may end up listening on the SoundCloud or watching this on YouTube, that Father, that they will, uh, instead of just dismissing this outright because they don't like what's being said, that they'll have a prayerful heart and search the scriptures themselves and come to a conclusion uh, that is right according to your word, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we've discussed all these reasons for clothing and the fact that it's supposed to be a covering and whatnot. Uh, and where we left off last week, and what I want to give you tonight, is not only is clothing meant to be a covering to cover our nakedness, and we won't get there tonight, but we'll be talking about this possibly next week or the week after, I don't know yet, uh, regarding, um, well, I'll, I'll just leave that alone, but, uh, but also clothing is an identifier. But before I get into all, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. This is a passage that is, I think, often quoted and used as an argument against teaching any kind of standards regarding uh, our outward appearance. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and you know the story, Samuel is at Jesse's house because he's supposed to be choosing the next king of Israel that's going to eventually replace Saul. And David was left in the field watching the sheep, and his other brothers were brought before Samuel. And it was common and, and understood that they brought the oldest brother, and the oldest one was rejected. But uh, Samuel's, when he saw the oldest brother and how brawny he was and strong he was and dignified he looked, he thought within himself, surely this is the one. And he was somewhat surprised that God said no. And then he just kept bringing the other brothers, and, and so eventually God rejected all of them. And Samuel's a little bit perplexed by this. But in verse 7, the Bible tells us, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. I can't tell you, I cannot count <clears throat> how many times I've heard someone use the scripture to say that it does not matter what we look like. Does not matter what our appearance is. Does not matter what we wear. And um, if I had a nickel for every time someone said that, um, I would be I would be set for life. And I'm being exaggerating there. I probably haven't heard it that many times, but uh, so often I hear that argument used. Uh, but there's a few problems with that argument. Number one is taking the scripture completely out of context. Now, they weren't talking about the man's clothing. They weren't talking about how he uh, portrayed himself. They're talking about his physical stature. It was talking about his height. In other words, man would see the strong height, the height of the man, and uh, and his stature and his strength, and say, "Wow, he must be a great leader." And uh, God says, "When it comes to choosing a leader, I'm more concerned about what's on the inside than I am what's on the outside." But he's not talking about whether or not he was modest or whether or not he was dressed a certain way. And so to say, well, God looks on the inside and man looks on the outside. Well, number, number two, all that is saying, 
All that's all that all that's being said there is he's just basically stating a fact. In other words, it's not a negative thing that man might look on the outward appearance. It's just a fact. For for instance, you cannot see physically. You cannot see my soul tonight. Now my soul is communicating with your soul, and we talked about that somewhat already in the series. And my spirit is, you know, in communication with God and, and so forth. And our souls can be knit together, but you can't see my soul. The only part of me that you can see, body, soul, and the spirit, is my body. So obviously man looks on the outward appearance because that's all we can see. Now to a degree we can see the inside. For instance, our soul being knit together and so forth. I mean, you, can, you can tell the spirit of a man, right? Uh, but what you see with your eyeballs is my outward appearance. And so whether fair or not fair, when we look upon each other, we do make decisions based on how someone is appearing or how someone is dressed. I'm going to show you that very clearly in Scripture. That's not a, that's not a negative thing. Uh, God looks on the heart, but God has a lot to say about our outwardness. Now, uh, for instance, we talked about this already, uh, but I made mention of it even a moment ago, that our bodies, not our soul, not our spirit, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You understand? The Holy Spirit is taking up residence within my body. I'm told in the scriptures that I'm supposed to honor God and love God with my body, soul, and spirit. It's not enough for me to honor Him with my soul. I'm supposed to honor Him with my body too. And I'm also supposed to honor Him with my spirit. I'm supposed to honor Him with my body too. In other words, my body is to be a reflection of my soul. My body is supposed to be the outward representation of that which is on the inside. And that is the only way we're told in the scriptures about being epistles uh, uh, read above, uh, uh, by all men and so forth. And uh, the context there is talking about how Paul was telling the people of Corinth that, that you're basically our letters of recommendation. You know, here we are telling people that God reached out and God saved you and, uh, and God did all these things. And, and so when people look at you, uh, you are basically testifying whether or not what we've been saying or what we've been preaching is true. But how are they doing so? By their actions, by their outward actions and by their appearance. In Romans chapter 12, the Bible says that I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your souls a living sacrifice. Is that what it says? That ye present your spirits a living sacrifice. Does it say that? That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, this is a sneak peek for you folks that come on Sunday morning. We're not there yet. Uh, we're still in Romans 8. But when we get to Romans chapter 12, you're going to learn that the reason why Paul said that, based on the previous chapters, I beseech ye therefore, is because Paul had made a statement that his heart's desire was that Israel would be saved. He said, I wish myself could be accursed if my kinsmen in the flesh, talking about Israel, could be saved. And here he is as an apostle to the Gentiles, not able to go to the Jews as much as he would like. And the Jews, for the most part, they rejected Paul's message. And so he went to the Gentiles. But he still had within his heart a desire to see that the Jews would get saved. We'll learn as we go through the Romans passage that Paul was saying to the Gentiles there that I'm hoping that when they see, the Jews see what is done in your life through this gospel, that it will provoke them to jealousy, that they too would come to know Christ as their Savior. You see, Paul had been preaching to the Jews that the righteousness that they've been trying to obtain by the keeping of the law, that they failed miserably to obtain it, that through the grace of God and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they could have that righteousness. And I'm not just talking about a positional righteousness. I'm not talking about the fact that I stand before God positionally righteous, although I do. I'm talking about the fact that Paul was teaching that it is through the gospel and the grace of God that we can have a practical righteousness. In other words, one of the biggest complaints the Jews had regarding Paul's message is all this time they've been trying to keep the law and now he's telling them that they can't do it and keeping the law won't get them close to God and keeping the law won't help them live right and now he's saying that these Gentiles who never had the law and never knew the law could obtain a righteousness that they could never obtain. I'm talking about a very physical, real form. In other words, they accused Paul of lasciviousness. 
They accused Paul that his gospel was a freedom to sin. They accused Paul that the gospel that he was preaching gave them a license to sin. And Paul was saying, no. It is through this gospel that a person can truly have victory over sin. It is through this gospel that a person can truly live righteous. And so when Paul gets to Romans chapter 12, he's begging the Gentiles, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice because I want these Jews to get saved and if you're acting like a bunch of devils and dressing like a bunch of devils and living like a bunch of devils, then you're making this gospel that I'm preaching, you're making it of none effect. And so I'm begging you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, do that which is right, and maybe, just maybe, some of these Jews would catch on and see that the gospel truly is what I've been saying it is. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. But how are they going to prove that? Well, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that acceptable, uh, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so, our outward appearance does matter. And so, the Samuel passage is not saying that God doesn't care about our outward appearance. It's actually saying to us, God can see past the outward appearance, and He knows what's in the heart of man. And when it comes to choosing next king, He's looking at much more than whether or not someone looks strong, and someone looks like they have leadership abilities. He's looking within the heart. But a truth that we ought to take away from this is, man does look on the outward appearance. And our outward appearance does say a lot about what we claim to believe. Does that make sense? And so clothing, I didn't get an affirm and uh, I did not get a positive response when I asked if that made sense. So who knows if I'm saying anything that's being caught or whatnot. But we'll go on and move on anyways. Clothing, we said, was an identifier. May I say to you, your clothes say a lot about you. And God has a lot to say about your clothes. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 14. We're just going to look at a bunch of scripture now and close this thing out. 2 Samuel chapter 14. We'll pick it up at verse 2. In fact, that's the only verse we're going to look at. In 2 Samuel 14 and verse 2, the Bible says, And Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, Feign thyself. Now, you all know what it means to feign yourself? Pretend. Pretend, fake, exactly. Feign thyself to be a mourner, and put on now mourning apparel, and anoint not thyself with oil, but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. Now, let me ask you a question. This woman, was she a mourner? No. No, she was not. But, but, uh, but Joab sent to her, and he said to her, Pretend to be a mourner. Feign thyself. Now, see, he was laying a trap. And he says, Feign thyself to be a mourner. And he said to her, Put on mourning apparel. In other words, she was not mourning. But whatever she was going to wear identified her as one grieving the loss of a loved one. Though it may not be true... It's what it says about her. You see, whether you like it or not, whether it seems fair or not, what we wear and how we carry ourselves and how we dress tells other people something about us. It tells them what we are, what we believe, what we think, so on and so forth. And uh, for instance, um, I was with a gentleman a few weeks ago and he had a MAGA hat on. Make America Great Again. And I immediately identified him as a Trump supporter. Why? Because he had a hat on that said M-A-G-A. -A. Now, he might not have been a Trump supporter, but if he wasn't one, I don't know why he'd be wearing that hat. 
uh, because, you know, you could get in a lot of trouble, it seems, if you go to the wrong restaurant wearing a MAGA hat. You might have, you know, drink thrown in your face or, or have your food spitted and so forth because that's the world we live in now in our, in our types of politics. But I assumed that he was a Trump supporter. I made a comment about it, and guess what? I was right. He was a Trump supporter. How did I know that? Because he was wearing a MAGA hat. And so here we have, in 2 Samuel, this woman, she was not a mourner. But because of the way she was dressed, it was assumed by everybody that she was a mourner. Your clothes say a lot about you. Turn to 1 Kings in chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. This is the story of Solomon. The queen of the south was coming to visit him. And if you understand the story... She had heard all kinds of rumors about Solomon. Heard about his wisdom. Heard how great he was. Heard about his subjects and his servants and so forth. And she thought to herself, this can't be true. And so her whole purpose for coming to meet King Solomon was she was going to try to find some fault with him. And try to find something about him. You know, some chink in his armor as it were. And the Bible says in verse 5 of 1 Kings chapter 10... And the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his uh, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. In other words, she, she watched everything. She watched all that they were doing. She was she was paying attention, <coughs> and she was trying to find fault. And uh, as he looked at. The, the wonderful meat that was at his table. She looked at how the servants sat in the sense of not their posture, but the, the, the sitting arrangements, I guess you could say. She looked at how the ministers attended uh, to things. Uh, she looked at the cupbearers. And uh, she watched the way that Solomon carried himself when he went up into the house of the Lord. But it also says she noticed their apparel. And that wasn't the only part of her decision-making process, but it affected her decision-making process. And when she saw that, the Bible says she had no more spirit in her. In other words, there's nothing left to fight. And she came to the conclusion that Solomon is truly the great king that everyone thinks he is. And as a result, a great treaty was given. And as a result, many, I believe it was cedar trees, uh, were supplied for the building of, uh, of the temple and so forth. Uh, we have the same scenario, same story. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 4, I'll just read it. It says, In the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, his cupbearers also, and their apparel, uh, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there is no more spirit in her. So in 2 Chronicles 9, 4, it mentions twice about their apparel. But basically, this apparel that they had on identified them as being in the king's service. And it also greatly impressed the queen. The way his servants dressed was a testimony to Solomon. May I make an application? I don't think will be too far from scriptural truth. But the way you and I dress as servants of the Lord, I'm not saying that we have to wear a suit everywhere we go. When I speak and I, you know, behind the pulpit, I, I wear a suit and so forth. Uh, if I was preaching in the Philippines, uh, for instance, I probably wouldn't be wearing a suit. Uh, but in the Philippines, their attire, they have, uh, you know, the shirts and the slacks and, and, and pants that they wear. Uh, but they also have attire that is, that is considered more dressy as opposed to the attire that's more casual. Uh, but obviously, I don't wear a suit everywhere I go. Uh, when I'm working on things and so forth, I'll wear jeans and whatnot. And uh, that's appropriate for that occasion. Uh, but the truth is, wherever we go, though, we are to be a testimony to the one that we serve. And so certainly, for instance, you won't ever find me wearing a t-shirt that has some sort of a questionable slogan on it. You know, like NASA. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but you won't find me wearing a t-shirt that has some sort of questionable slogan on it. Okay? And, uh, or, or something that, uh, uh, you know, a t-shirt that has a rock band name on it. Or, you know, has some sort of, you know, skull and crossbones or anything else like that. Simply because it's important to me that I'm representing the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if I were to be presented with an opportunity to give someone the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to make sure that I'm not wearing anything that recalls there to be a question of whether or not my Lord was truly the one and the only living God. And His holiness 
You see, this is, this is God's temple. And so I ought to dress God's temple accordingly. Uh, but we find that she was greatly impressed. And the way his servants dressed was a testimony to Solomon. And in many respects, the way you and I dress ought to be and is a testimony to your king. Let's look at another one. Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10. Ezra 3, verse 10, the Bible says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And so there's nothing here except for the fact to say that the priests had on certain type of clothing. Why? Well, he identified them as priests. If anyone would have put on one of those garments, it would have been assumed that they were priests. And so again, there's nothing great spiritual significance here except to say that our clothing identifies us. If I were to, and I used this illustration not long ago when I talked about abstaining from all appearance of evil, but if I were to go into a bank with a ski mask on, and I don't mean just having it on top of my head, but I mean pull down with just, you know, the eye holes and so forth, you know, it could be dead of winter, but they would very quickly tell me to lift up my ski mask. You know, unless I was Muslim and I had a hijab, hijab for whatever reason, that's okay. Uh, which, you know, that's a, I don't agree with. Uh, but anyways, if I had a ski mask on, uh, they're going to assume that I might be there to rob the bank. And so I would have to roll it up in such a way that it's not there. Now, if I went in with a pair of stockings over my head... <laughs> That's all the more. I mean, there's, there's no excuse for wearing stockings on my head. That's not going to keep me warm. That's to disfigure the face so I can get away with robbing the bank, right? So if I don't want people to think I'm a bank robber, I probably ought not to go into banks with stockings on my head. And uh, for that matter, for those of you that might be concerned, I won't be wearing stockings anywhere, <laughs> okay? Um, but if I don't want... It's okay. Uh, but so here we find that, that uh, they have the apparel of priests. All right, let's look at another one. Esther... Chapter 5, Esther chapter 5, verse 1. <coughs> now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner courts of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. Now, she said on this third day she put on her royal apparel. Does she wear that particular royal apparel all the time? I'm guessing from the way it's worded that she did not. She wore that royal apparel whenever she was going to go into the inner court of the king's house. In other words, it was appropriate for the occasion that she would wear her royal apparel. And uh, we'll look at another one. Exeter 6. Look at chapter 6 and verse 8. And it says, Let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which set upon his head. And so this is talking about the king now. And the king uses this to wear. He's about ready to head out. And they had the horse there. And he's put on royal apparel. Why? So that wherever he went, there'd be no question. He's the king. Are we good so far? The crown on his head. Look at chapter 8. And verse 15. Chapter 8 and verse 15. The Bible says, And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. So Mordecai uh, gets promoted, right? And when he leaves the presence, he now leaves in this royal apparel. And it says, signify his position and signify his promotion and to signify the fact that he's been honored. But the apparel said something about him. Over in Acts in chapter 12, I'll just read it, verse 21. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration under them. And so again, 
these different apparels, identify them as royalty. Uh, of one sort or another, but identify them as royalty. And again, I'll use the illustration. If I were standing up here in a police uniform, you know, you might assume, except the fact that you know me, okay? But if I were to go out in about town in a police uniform, you might assume that I'm a police. And yet we have that there's a, a major... Um, there's a major issue with someone wearing a police uniform who is not a police. And uh, in fact, you could get arrested for, uh, what's the term? Can't think of it. Impersonating. Impersonating a police officer. And so again, we see the importance, even in our society, of uniform and apparel and whatnot. It identifies us. Let me look at another one with you. Zephaniah, chapter 1. <coughs> Zephaniah, chapter 1. Haggai, Zephaniah. So it's right there near the end of the Old Testament. <coughs> Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifices that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. Okay, and uh, it's possible that the strange apparel that identified them as outsiders was different, right? Uh, look at another one with me in James, turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. So, church, whether or not you like it, um, you know, whether or not you like it, your clothing is important. What you wear, how you dress. Uh, from a modesty standpoint, which we'll get into that a little bit deeper as to what the Bible means by modest apparel. Right now we're just looking at apparel in general. But we do understand that the necessity of the clothing is to cover our nakedness. And we saw what God says about nakedness. And we saw what God considers nakedness. Now you've got to decide whether you're going to go with God's standards or you're going to go with the world standards. That changes every moment. Okay. Uh, but in James 2, in verse 2, the Bible says, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and it goes on and talks about how that we shouldn't give preference to the one that looks like he's well to do as opposed to the one that is not. And that's something certainly that it's important to be said. I'll go ahead and park here. Although I realize our attendance is down tonight because of sickness and so forth, but um, so I'm not. Well, anyways, I'll just say this: uh, we might, from time to time, have visitors come. Look, okay, this church does not have a dress code. Okay, someone comes to church now. I suppose, obviously, if someone came in here and they were just wearing their underwear, you know, we might have an issue. Okay, we or ask them to leave. Okay, or or you know, put some clothes on them or something like that. Uh, but as to you know, a dress code in generality is this church does not have a dress code in that respect. And um, I knew of a church down in Florida. Um, if I understand the way it worked, the, the pastor had a uh, standard and conviction very similar to my own. Uh, but he went a, a step further. And, uh, and so nobody, you know, was allowed in the church. Uh, and it was mainly aimed at women. Uh, were not allowed in the church if they weren't dressed a certain way. Even their van route or their bus route when they bring in kids, you know, from the public schools and so forth. The kids have hardly ever been to church. First time visitors could get off the bus. And uh, if they were, were not wearing the proper attire set up by this pastor, they would have two options. They would either have to go into a side room and have a lady fit them with, with clothing or they'd have to go home. Now that's not a position that I take. And that's not a position I'm asking you to take. I'm not asking you to be judgmental of each other. I'm asking you to be judgmental of yourself and, uh, and so forth. And, and of course, as we talk about relationships, I've got my young people here, my, my two kids with me. Uh, I ask you to be judgmental as far as whether or not you're going to be in a relationship with somebody who does not have the proper standards of attire and so forth. Uh, but in James 2, he says, you, uh, if you got someone coming to your church that, you know, looks like they're well-to-do and you have another one that has vile raiment, it just means that, you know, he's poor and possibly destitute and you know, whatnot. You know, we've had folks come in our church and, and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, 
because of whatever reason, uh, they, they just don't have very many clothes to choose from, and, and maybe they weren't dressed to the nines and so forth. That's okay. That's all right. Main thing is that they're covered, right? Am I right? Okay. You got to help me out, folks. You're not responding to me at all, and it makes me wonder if I have to start over for you. Now everyone says amen. All right, but, uh, but here we find there's a distinction made by apparel in James 2. There's a distinction that's made by what they wear. All right, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 with me again. This is where we started off. We're just about done. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but with good works. And then if you look at the parenthetical statement, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay, so clothing is an identifier. And here we find it identifies this woman, these women who would wear modest apparel and not going uh, overboard is basically what's talking about with, with their makeup, shamefacedness and sobriety, and not going overboard with their embroidered hair or their gold or their pearls or costly array, but rather that they would be more adorning themselves with good works. And so the point is that what we wear, ladies, what you wear, not only is it supposed to be modest from the point of view that, of covering your nakedness, but it also is to identify you as a child of God. And therefore, it ought to be done in such a way that uh, it would show off your spirit or your soul, your good works, as opposed to showing off your body. But we find here that it identifies one who is godly and modest as opposed to being identified as a harlot. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 10, it's the last verse we're going to look at. <coughs> Proverbs 7 and verse 10. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a an harlot and subtle of heart. Okay, oh, well, attire of a harlot. What does that mean? It means she was dressed like a prostitute. There was clothing that was obviously clothing that would be worn by someone who was a harlot. And so our clothing identifies us. And uh, I'm afraid that in our day and age, we have, we have blurred the line so much between what is appropriate and what is not. And if we're speaking of ladies, and it's unfortunate I'm speaking to a small crowd of ladies tonight, uh, but if we're speaking of ladies, uh, we have blurred that line in such a way that uh, the idea of modesty and proper apparel is just completely gone out the window. Uh, there is no shame anymore. There is no more blushing. Uh, women are, are perfectly fine with exposing parts of their body that ought to be covered up. And even when they do cover it up, it's so skin tight, you might as well not cover it up. You know? And, uh, and that is not according to a woman that professes to be godly. But rather, it's very much the category of one who is wearing the attire of a harlot. If you don't want to be assumed that you're easy or that you're a harlot or that you're promiscuous, then don't dress like you are. I believe that as men, we have a responsibility when we're talking and having a conversation with a lady, that we have a responsibility to keep our eyes on their eyes. I was having a conversation with my wife about this the other day because I didn't know how appropriate or inappropriate it would be for me to make certain comments. And so some of these comments I'm not going to make simply because I don't have time to protect myself with all kinds of, uh, you know, examples so that you don't accuse me of anything. Uh, but this much I will say. Uh, there are, you know, women, for instance, they, I don't know, the nightclub scene and so forth. Or even, unfortunately, even in church, they've got uh, everything out on display. And, uh, and the reason why they're dressed that way, there's only one reason why a woman would dress in such a way to, to accentuate her, her uh, body type and her figure. There's only one reason why a woman would dress in such a way to expose, whether it be through excessive cleavage or through uh, short 
uh, you know, showing off the thigh and so forth, or having such skin tight uh, uh, jeans and so forth on that there's hardly any any uh, uh, hidden anything hidden from the imagination. And the whole purpose of that is to draw the attention of man. Okay, or you know, in this day and age, maybe to draw the attention of another woman, which you know is another whole story of itself. And so this whole thing about, you know, hey, my eyes are up here. I agree. We ought to be looking at your eyes. But if you don't want a man to look somewhere else, why are you showing it off? Yeah. Yes, men have a responsibility to be, uh, to be of integrity and to respect women and look, and look them in the eyes. But women have a responsibility to respect themselves and stop dressing like they're getting sold at a meat market. You okay over there? I've got to giggle out of my wife on that one, you know. But yeah, now I've not heard this because I've not been guilty of uh, of getting myself caught in the situations. But you hear the phrase such as, you know, my eyes are up here. Well, yes, yes. But if you don't want the man to be looking down your blouse, you might not be wanting to wear a blouse that a man can look down. Right. And so you ought to be careful how you dress in such a way that one of the things my wife would teach young girls when we, uh, you know, when she has the opportunity to teach teenagers and so forth. Uh, when you're standing there in your bathroom and you're getting ready for going out and uh, you're looking in the mirror, if you lean forward and look up, whatever you can see, you can guarantee anyone else can see too if you ever were to lean forward. You know, and uh, I remember one time we were, uh, when we were at First Baptist, uh, my uh, Jeremiah, I think it was, I forget what grade he was, but we're talking, you know, kindergarten type grade or whatever. And uh, there he was sitting in Sunday school and I had to go pick him up early. I forget why we had to go somewhere. I forget exactly what it was, uh, early dismissal, I don't know. And the Sunday school teacher was sitting there uh, in her chair and all the kids were sitting on the floor looking up at her and her skirt it might have been considered long enough in the sense that her thighs were covered, but because of how short it was and how the kids were sitting, all those little boys had a direct view right up her skirt, and from that day forward, he was no longer in that Sunday school class. I'm simply saying I don't think that she was doing anything wrong mentally. I don't think she meant to do anything wrong, but I'm saying that she wasn't thinking straight. Ladies, you have a responsibility. It is your body... You hear that all the time in this day and age. It's my body. Yes, it is. So cover it up. Don't make a man have to always walk around like he's got blinders on. Men, you're responsible not to be looking, but ladies, stop putting it out in the window. But the truth of the matter is, this concept of modest apparel and proper, properly dressing and so forth applies to both men and women. And how we dress does say something about us. And ultimately, it says something about our Lord. Clothing identifies you. If you don't want to be identified as a harlot, don't dress like one. If you don't want to be identified as a mourner, don't dress like one. If you don't want to be identified as a royal person, don't dress. The point is, how you dress matters. And your body is supposed to be sacred. And it's supposed to be holy and set apart for the purpose of God. And how we clothe ourselves does matter matter. Alright, that's all we're going to have time for tonight, and we'll go ahead and move on to the prayer meeting portion.